Hi and welcome to Neat AI. So I'm going to build up the exclusive or solution detailed in Ken Stanley's original paper from scratch and work in any missing details from other implementations or published research I can find on the web. It'll include known and connection definitions, speciation, crossover, weight and topology mutation methods and rates and I'll also look at how all those elements affect each other. I'll go into as much detail as possible on the concepts from each section but it'll be coding language independent so once it's complete so you can have a population for your genetic algorithm to work on. If you don't know what a class is, well, I salute your ambition, but would suggest a more entry-level coding project to get started with. At the end of this project, you'll have something resembling this, which will consistently solve the exclusive or problem, ideally with the same or better level of success as detailed in the paper. And you can easily reuse this code in other projects, as all you'll need to do is adjust the input layer and what you do with the output. This will include the elusive one hidden node solution, and we'll also see if we can get the zero hidden node working as well, albeit with a recurrent connection. So what is the exclusive OR problem that we're trying to solve, and what use is it? Typically it's portrayed in a table format with the output yielding a 1, only if the inputs are different. It has lots of applications. Way back in the dawn of time when I was at college, it was explained in terms of a light switch in a hallway. Someone at the bottom of the stairs could switch it on or off, and someone at the top of the stairs could do likewise, if it was wired as an exclusive OR gate. Here's a basic example with the weights and activation functions displayed. It's very easy to bring this into Excel and get it working, which is handy if you want to see what's happening with the input and output from each node. So let's make a start. The first thing I did was to create a number of global variables to capture the requirements for population size and the initial parameters for the network topology. I also include an option for defining the percentage of connections that are to be set at startup. This is handy for larger networks when it's set to a low percentage as it encourages the network to discover only the connections it requires and promotes the concept of starting simply and allowing complexity to emerge if it adds value. This is also promoted by having the ability to add hidden nodes at startup. Simply adding one node can significantly reduce the number of connections required for a fully connected network when it initializes. The next thing is to create a class which will contain the core network functions and properties. These functions being initialize, add a node, add a connection, mutate the weights, load inputs and run the network. Before we can create the initialize function though, Let's talk about the nodes and connections. We need some form of user-defined data type to capture node and connection properties. For nodes, we need a node identifier, node type. So is it an input, bias, hidden or output node? Layer information and also a record of the node input and output values. For connections, we'll need an innovation ID, a record of which node it's coming from or which node it's going to, its weight value, whether or not it's enabled and whether or not it's a recurrent connection. A recurrent connection is defined as simply being a connection whose out node ID, which is the node it's connecting to, is in the same or lower layer as the node it's coming from. More on recurrent connections later. An innovation ID needs to be unique for every connection node pair. For example, the innovation ID for a connection going from node 2 to node 5 in a network will be the same for every node 2 to node 5 connection in every network in the entire population, wherever such a connection exists. I simply create a big lookup table to store innovation IDs for connections. For the example shown, it would look up the 2.5 value in the table and use that as the innovation ID. And every 2.5 connection would do exactly the same thing, which means they'd all have the same innovation ID. This value, of course, is going to be different for a connection going from node 5 to node 2. So let's look at the initialize function. It serves one purpose, and that's to populate the arrays holding the node and connections for the network with the startup values identified earlier. It loops through the number of input nodes, bias nodes, output nodes and hidden nodes and enters them into the array. I also store the output nodes directly after the input nodes as it makes it easier to locate them when running the network, although I could just scan through the array and find them. As hidden nodes get added later during the mutation phase, the layer property of all nodes, except the input and bias nodes, get checked and are updated if needed, but their location in the node array is always the same. It then populates the connections array by looping through each hidden node and adding a connection to each input node, and then loops through the output layer nodes and adds a connection to each hidden layer node. If there are no hidden nodes, of course, it's even easier to simply add connections between the input and the output layer nodes. And of course, if the initial connection percentage isn't set to 100%, it generates a number between 1 and 100. And if it's below whatever threshold is set, then it doesn't add to the connection. The initial weights for the connections are completely random and vary between minus 20 and plus 20. So that's fine for this stage, but as soon as I create the add node and add connection functions, those arrays are going to get difficult to read and fault check. So the next thing I did was create the ability to draw any of the networks on a canvas based on the contents of their node and connection arrays. I added a new function to my class called draw the network, 
and checked how many layers and how many nodes per layer I have by running through the node array. This defines how many columns I need on the canvas and also how many rows per column I'll need. And I use that info to position and draw some circles on the screen and label them. I then go through my connection array and draw some lines between the circles. I color code these for clarity. In this example, if a connection is enabled and it's green, disabled is red and recurrent is blue. For display purposes, I normally wouldn't want to display disabled connections as it gets really crowded. So I gave myself the option to switch those off. This may seem really basic, but it's really helpful to be able to visualize these networks as they get bigger and change through the mutation and crossover stages later on. So with the network created, I need the ability to load inputs to the input layer nodes. I created a function for this, which takes the input values and loads them into the node array. As the input layer nodes don't have an activation function between their input and output, I can simply copy the node input to the node output. Of course, the network will only use that input value if the node is connected to something. If it's not, then it'll just sit there. I also need a function to run the network, which will propagate the input values through the network to the output layer nodes. This works by starting at layer two and scanning through the node array, looking for nodes which have been placed in this layer. When it finds one, it sets its input to zero and then scans through the connection array, looking for connections that terminate at this node. When it finds one of those, it checks to see where that connection originated and grabs the output value from that node. It multiplies it by the connection weight and adds the result to the input value of the target node. And then it continues scanning through the connection array, looking for more connections that terminate at this node and repeats the process until it gets to the end. This approach captures all the connections going to that node and once the input is known, I apply the activation function to it and use the return value to populate the node output value. It then goes back to scanning through the node array, looking for another node in layer two. If it finds one, then it just repeats the process to populate the node input and output. In our case here though, we only have one node at layer two. So once we reach the end of our node array, we move on to the next layer. So in layer three, we again start scanning through the node array, looking for nodes located in layer three. When we find one, we again zero its input and scan through the connection array, looking for connections that terminate at it and work out the correct input and output values for that node. And once we've worked through all the nodes in every layer, we're done. But now I need a function to give me the output value from any of the nodes. So I created the get output function, which simply takes the past node ID, looks up the output from the node array and returns this value. And of course, I'll also need to keep track of the fitness and species ID of each object in the population. So I create a couple of public fields or properties to track those values. So with that fairly basic class complete, I can now populate an array by creating multiple instances of the class, storing them in an array and calling the initialize function for each of them. As I'm going to use this for the exclusive OR solution, I'll be starting each class with three input nodes, zero hidden nodes and one output node. I don't really need a bias node for this, but it's used in the original paper, so I'll include it. I then take each population member in turn and ask it the four questions. This involves using the load input routine to set the inputs, running the network, and then getting the output from node four. If it gets the output correct, it gets a full score of one added to its fitness value. Once the four questions have been asked, its fitness is determined for this generation and it moves on to the next population member. The maximum fitness that can be obtained is a value of four. This is repeated until it's gone through the entire population. At this stage, generation zero is complete and we're now ready to create the next generation. This process, of course, will favor the fitter members of the population and involves speciation, crossover and mutation. If you're interested in seeing how that works out, well, you know what to do. As always, thanks for watching.